This is Jim Grimes reporting on the use of video cameras, microphones, and still cameras in the Illinois trial courts. After the media frenzy of the 1930s trial of Bruno Richard Hauptmann for the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, the American Bar Association enacted policies barring radio, newsreels, and photo cameras from those trials. Federal and state courts followed suit. And for more than 40 years, reporters could only use pen and paper in covering trials. But as technology changed, states began to allow electronic media into their Supreme Appellate and Circuit Courts. On January 24, 2012, Illinois became the 36th state to allow cameras and microphones in the Circuit Courts. Supreme Court Chief Justice Thomas L. Kilbride announced at that time a pilot extended media coverage policy, which allows Circuit Courts to opt into allowing electronic media into their trials. But although the Supreme Court is not forcing the policy on the courts, there have been some concerns about allowing such coverage. Justice Kilbride. I think, uh, you know, those who are the skeptics, whether they're lawyers or judges, I think it's important for them to, uh, to be involved in the process and, and to raise those issues, uh, to bring it to the court, to talk to our press secretary, uh, Joe Tiber, and, uh, and I think it's important for those who have reservations about it to talk to those who are involved, meaning other judges, other lawyers, uh, and, and sit down and speak with uh, the news media in a local uh, circuit. News cameras have been allowed in the Illinois Supreme Court and appellate court since 1983. Audio and video of all Supreme Court oral arguments and audio of appellate court arguments are posted at the Illinois Supreme Court website. And Twitter has been used to communicate court orders, opinions, and announcements. Justice Kilbride. I practiced law in the Quad Cities for 20 years before I joined the court, and that's uh, the Illinois-Iowa border. And Iowa's had cameras in the courtroom for I don't know how many years now, but several years at the time. In our local media market, we had three basic ABC, NBC, CBS. They all would occasionally cover trials in in, uh, Scott County. That's the Davenport, Iowa area. And as a lawyer, uh, I uh, observed all kinds of trial coverage and never heard any problems from lawyers or judges with whom I spoke it from time to time. And uh, so I came out of that background where I had seen it and, and lawyers, again, had never told me that they experienced any problems on the Iowa side, including lawyers who worked both sides, the Iowa courtroom and the Iowa. Illinois courtroom. So that's where it really started. When candidate Kilbride was campaigning in the 1990s in Galesburg, a radio reporter asked him about cameras in the courtroom. He asked me about when is the court going to allow cameras in the courtroom? And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Why would a radio person ask about cameras? Well, obviously, his interest was more than just cameras. It was the radio as well. But uh, that's what got me started. And I told that gentleman at that time, I said, well, I relayed my experience in Iowa, so I said, you know, uh, the way I view all rules of the Illinois Supreme Court is that there are rules that are there to make the court work well, and if they need to be reviewed and improved, whether it's that rule or any other rule, I told them I was going to be committed to that process. When I became the chief, at least the the door was open for me to propose some initiatives, and that was the one I I wanted to, uh, among others, uh, propose then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Kilbride explains why the court proceeded with the pilot. We really didn't have a big debate over it, and uh, uh, everybody around the table was open to it, and uh, without the full support of the court, I wouldn't have been able to proceed, but I did put it on the table, so to speak, and folks uh, were open to the idea. There's, Of course, individuals had different concerns and questions, but we, we didn't... Uh, propose it just uh, as, a, as a blank check. I mean, our press secretary, you know, Joe Tiber, he uh, spent a lot of time researching and going through uh, materials, not just from Iowa, because I, I did have the materials from Iowa, but he looked at other states. And I think the comparison when we show the border states of, of Iowa, Wisconsin, and I think maybe Indiana to some degree at the time, uh, and other, other places around the country. That, that probably was persuasive as much as anything to, to show that it had a, a record that worked well. 
Extended media coverage in any trial is subject to the authority of the presiding trial judge. The recent policy reinforces the authority of the judge to maintain decorum and prevent distractions, guarantee the safety of the courtroom and participants, and ensure the fair and impartial administration of justice. To date, 14 of the state's 24 circuits participate in the pilot, the most recent being the Sixth Circuit in East Central Illinois, which was granted permission in September of 2013. Pressure to allow cameras and microphones in the trial courts began decades ago. In 1978, Bill Miller, then director of the Sangamon State University, now University of Illinois Springfield Public Affairs Reporting Program, filed several requests on behalf of the Illinois News Broadcasters Association and other media organizations. The Supreme Court denied all of those petitions without comment. With the new pilot program, the court acted without a petition being filed. Jennifer Fuller of WSIU Radio in Carbondale and past president of the Illinois News Broadcasters Association. We're certainly um, standing on the shoulders of those who've come before us, and I'm so grateful for the people who did fight for all those years. It's been decades that we've been asking to use the tools that we have in the courtrooms where we're doing our work. I hear from a lot of people who are using this trial and and working through how we make this happen. We have a lot of people who have experience because they work in what we call a border market between Illinois and Iowa or Illinois and Missouri. Um, I actually am in a border market that includes Illinois, Missouri, and Kentucky. So we're all kind of taking a look at the rules and making things work. Are we where we want to be in the end yet? No, but we are really making great strides in making this information available to the public, showing them what's happening within their own government buildings in their courtrooms. And I really think that in the end, it's going to be a really great thing. Jennifer Fuller. The Illinois State Bar Association has also weighed in. ISBA President Paula Holderman is an attorney with Winston and Strawn in Chicago. Well, the ISBA's position is, of course, we're fully in support of um, the Supreme Court's um, pilot program for extended uh, coverage. So we we think that, you know, is exactly what we um, should be doing. And I think one of the reasons that we favor uh, the way it's currently set up is, uh, one, the, the chief judge of the particular circuit has to opt in, but then, more importantly, it's the individual judge presiding over that specific case that gets to make the final call. And I think having the discretion in the judge um, to make that decision, uh, to take into account you know, various factors that could be um, present in, in any given case, I think that's where uh, you know, we, we felt more comfortable, the judge having that discretion. The courts and the Bar Association also share a concern about funding for the judicial branch in a time of government austerity. The ISBA obviously does believe in you know, access to the courts and um, having more transparency, and frankly, uh, we think it would be probably important uh, just in terms of uh, citizens understanding how the courts work. You know, right now, um, I'm sure you know that both the federal courts and the state courts generally uh, are are in a funding crisis, candidly. Um, Of course, the federal courts are under a, uh, as part of the entire federal uh, sequestration uh, budget, but the state courts are also um, in in a very challenging uh, time. And so part of the ISBA's mission is to do more education of the public about just what the judicial system uh, does and how it serves the people. And frankly, if you don't have enough money for your judicial system, things are going to come to a halt. Um, Because, of course, it's not just criminal cases uh, that the courts hear. We've got civil cases, cases involving businesses, um, cases involving your rather personal life. And it's hard to move on sometimes and live your life because you've got maybe a matter in court that the judge can't get to because of, you know, funding cuts. So, yeah, I think access to the the courts and people being able to see the courts in action is, is crucial. The Bar Association president also shared some issues that jurists have raised across Illinois. I guess one of the concerns that I have as a, as a lawyer um, is how the press is going to cover a case. So, for instance, um, 
I think it would be unfortunate if, for instance, they only covered, you know, like one witness on the prosecution side, and you never heard if, in fact, there was somebody on the defendant's side, or maybe you didn't hear, you know, the other witnesses in that case, or if they just come in um, at the end to get the verdict. So I'm just, my only concern is that somehow things could be skewed. In media, there is a certain amount of, um, oh, I know sensationalism is a little too harsh, but the the need to entertain the viewers and, uh, and the need to present information in short sound bites. And sometimes you do not get the full picture when you've got those exciting little sound bites that really don't capture what's going on. So that would represent one of my areas of concern. Holderman says schools of journalism should enhance their curriculum on covering the judicial branch of government. Reporters, journalists, uh, anybody doing news media coverage does need to understand what it is that they're watching. And I think they also need to understand just the, um, I don't know, the integrity of of presenting uh, both sides. I mean, that that's really what our judicial system is about, is giving uh, both sides, usually it's two sides, both sides an opportunity to present um, their evidence and then to make argument. And if you have the media taking one side, then it's going to make the entire system appear lopsided, and that would be that would be unfair. The issue of how to treat crime victims in the media is also a concern heard across the state, as Holderman explains. The challenge that Chief Justice Kilbride and the rest of the Supreme Court uh, were trying to meet when they um, in, you know, excluded certain kinds of witnesses, for instance, from the extended coverage, um, because you do have to balance um, the needs of private citizens versus, I guess, the right of access um, of, of the public. Um, but, you know, there are certain witnesses, I guess maybe I would say generally victims. Let's just take victims as a, as a larger class of witnesses. You know, you know, here they've been victimized once, and then they have to testify at trial because that's what our system uh, requires, that in a criminal case a defendant have an opportunity uh, to, um, to confront the witnesses against him or her and to cross-examine. Okay, so now we, we put the, the victim through that and then we're, we're going to film uh, and, and the, the victim and then it's going to show up on the, you know, the 10 o'clock news. Um, so yeah, so I've got some concerns in criminal cases about re-victimization um, in ongoing victimization. So, so that's a concern, um, certainly in criminal cases. You know, in, um, in civil cases, um, you know, things like adoption, uh, I guess, again, I would have some privacy concerns. Uh, divorce, now I know this is kind of a hot topic uh, right now, uh, not necessarily in terms of media coverage, but there's been a lot of um, uh, controversy over uh, sealed cases, uh, and in, in oftentimes in uh, divorce matters. And does the public have a right to know what is in those sealed cases? And I think that's a legitimate question. Um, and so I think that same question can kind of extend to TV coverage. Um, does the public have a right to know what, you know, two people struggling through a divorce uh, you know, and the anguish and, and the anxiety and the finances involved in that? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I guess maybe personally I'm thinking maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe it is none of our business. But then again, um, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, uh, the people in your camp would argue that, yes, they do, and that it's all part of the checks and balances. And why should only certain people, say people who, who do have um, a, a reputation in a community or perhaps uh, large fortunes involved, that somehow those are the people who get their cases sealed and, you know, people who don't have those same privileges um, are, are exposed to the public. So, again, it gets back to that issue um, as well. Paula Holderman, president of the Illinois State Bar Association. Although Cook County is not currently part of the pilot program, MSNBC Television was granted access for a graduation ceremony in treatment court, 
where Judge Rosemary Grant Higgins presided. In the special court, women who have been exploited are given the opportunity to rehabilitate their lives. Higgins said she has a hybrid view of cameras and mics in the courtroom. She said many defenders are not on board with cameras in the courtroom because privacy is an issue. For the MSNBC program, some of the faces were blurred to protect privacy concerns. And there was also a concern for witnesses in felony cases. Higgins asked would cameras in the courts prevent drug case witnesses from coming forward. But Judge Higgins also mentioned a positive side to cameras in the courts. It's good for the public to see efforts that they are making to turn lives around, she said. And the community needs to see what we're doing so they can join us. As has been a pattern across the state, 11th Circuit Chief Judge Elizabeth Robb set up meetings with judges, the legal community, and local media to work out concerns before beginning the pilot. It took 10 months of planning and preparation, according to William Scanlon, 11th Circuit Court Administrator. Scanlon worked with media representatives on technical arrangements to set up one courtroom for video coverage with a feed to pool reporters. He said it's been a very positive experience for the court. The coverage has been balanced, and the act of setting up cameras has not been a burden to the judges, jurors, or others. And he added, on a case-by-case basis, the coverage has not raised any security issues. Bill Workman is the first assistant state's attorney in McLean County and served as a prosecutor for a homicide case in May of 2013 with extended media coverage. He reported no complaints. Workman added that the defense did file an objection initially to the pilot media coverage, but it was not granted. In that case, the defendant's mother objected to being videotaped when she appeared as a witness, and no one objected to her motion, which was granted. Workman says he hasn't seen anyone playing to the cameras, something that you've heard others raise as an issue. In fact, Workman says he usually forgets they're even there. The Illinois Supreme Court rules call for local media to designate one of their own as a coordinator. Edith Brady Lunny, a reporter for the Bloomington Panograph, is the 11th Circuit media coordinator. We started using cameras in the courts in January of this year after our chief judge, Elizabeth Robb, signed the order. Uh, About a month later, we started with a sentencing in a murder case. We've had two murder trials and a major drug trial since that time that we have covered. And what, what's been the experience, uh, both for reporters, but as well as the, uh, the courts? We feel that things have gone very smoothly so far. Um, we've had a couple little tweaks that we have done in terms of scheduling um, and making sure that we're in the courtroom at the appropriate time and that there's absolutely no disruptions uh, with the trial. But we, we've really had no complaints um, from the judges. We feel everything's gone very smoothly so far. And can you tell me a little bit about, uh, you mentioned you had a couple of murder trials. Yes. Now, is that the only thing that's being covered in, in the circuit? We're trying to cover a variety of cases, not just the biggest high-profile cases. We're trying to get into some um, drug trials. We have a shooting case that we're going to be covering in September, and I would like to get in and cover some civil cases as well uh, so that we can use this really as an educational tool for the public to show and tell them what's going on in the courts. Edith brady Lunny is a reporter for the Bloomington Panograph and serves as the 11th Circuit's media coordinator. McLean County, unlike some others in the state, allows laptops and cell phones in the courthouse. The use of laptops by reporters covering the trial of Christopher Harris, who was eventually convicted of murdering five members of a Beeson family, was also permitted in Peoria, where the trial had been moved. Online blogs and Twitter entries during the court sessions allowed reporters real-time contact with the public during the trial. According to Scanlon, the access worked very effectively and was not disruptive. Tony Capriolo, managing editor of the local news service in Chicago, is media coordinator for DuPage and Kane counties. He coordinated coverage of the three-week murder trial of Johnny Borisov, who was convicted of murdering three members of a Darien family. 
that streamed live on ABC and NBC and, and in other places. And so that was, uh, you know, in DuPage County, that was our big, big test. And again, it, it seemed to go really well. In fact, we even had a juror after the fact say when the judge admonished her about, hey, you know, don't pay any attention to the cameras. It doesn't make this trial any more or less important. She kind of went, cameras? What cameras? So that was good to hear, that even even the jury kind of didn't really know we were there day in and day out. Any technical things you've come across, either for in terms of uh, videography or audio uh, that has come up uh, that surprised you that it worked so well or issues where you, you've had to, still to be resolved? I think mostly it's been really good. Um, you know, As you probably know, the Supreme Court rules call for no alterations of courtrooms or anything at the taxpayer's expense. So anything that goes on um, has to be at the media's expense. So for the most part, what we've done and been fairly successful doing is plug into the courtroom audio system in DuPage County. It's actually worked quite well. You know, some of these courthouses are old, and the audio system isn't great, and there are going to be some things we have to work out. I think Kane County is going to be a challenge in some, you know, at some points. I'll be honest with you, I'm a little surprised how smoothly it's gone. We've kind of hit it at a good time in terms of videography. Our ability to go live now with something no bigger than the size of a backpack really helps the cause. We're not cabling in and out of courtrooms all over the place. Yeah, technically, I, I have to be honest, even I've been relatively surprised with how smoothly it's all gone. And, and I know that on the court side, they are as well. Tony Capriolo is media coordinator for DuPage and Kane Counties. Schomburg defense attorney Thomas Glasgow says that for the public, it's very good because it takes away some of the mystique. Glasgow reports that some defendants are stone cold terrified when they come to court. They don't know what's going to happen to them. Unveiling some of that mystery is important. He says having cameras can also have an impact on the way things are presented. Glasgow says the law is very powerful. It can take away your life and liberty. Prosecutors are very powerful, and cameras may temper that. Enhanced media coverage has ranged from newspaper photographers taking a few photos at various trials to -to gavel-to-gavel coverage of a Kankakee murder trial that was broadcast live over WGN's Chicago cable channel, CLTV. To date, minor technical and procedural problems have been worked out in the various circuits among the media and court personnel, and no disruptions of court proceedings have been reported. Justice Kilbride. Because not everyone is able to go down to a courthouse during a given day and see what's going on, and people obviously read about trials that take place, because news reporters, as you know, have covered trials for for decades, for (laughs) centuries. Uh, But... uh, so it's, it's to bring to the public what they really can't get that easily. And the other thing is really a, a sense, ideally, and, and ultimately, is to inform the public better about how our court system works. It's sort of a civics lesson. It's not what people see when they tune into Law & Order on TV. It's much more boring, probably. But, uh, and that's why the, you know, the, the public television stations and a few of the others, including WGN, uh, that did a uh, uh, gavel-to-gavel coverage, I think it was WGN out of Kankakee, where somebody can see the, the mechanics of the case from selecting a jury to the, the verdict in the case from A to Z. That's really a, an education about our judicial court system. And I think it's, it's in our own best interest to educate the public, to allow the public to uh, look inside and see what's going on. And what about surprises, things that you didn't anticipate uh, with this type of a process, uh, positive things, things that have, have come up uh, uh, since it was initiated? Well, I guess on the, on the positive side of surprises is that it's, it's been successful in, in, a, in, a, in a collaborative kind of way that I just really didn't know for sure what was going to happen. I mean, I really didn't know how it was going to play out. But I did say from day one that, in my view, uh, it would have to sell itself. And you and your colleagues in the news media have really approached this in an extremely professional way, working cooperatively and collaboratively. I mean, cooperatively among themselves, but then collaboratively and and with cooperation too, but with the judicial court system, the judges, and not just the judges, the court administration, because it includes the sheriff's department, includes court administrators. All those people play a, a piece in this, this puzzle. And it's all worked so well together. I mean, that's been been really positive. I, I can't <clears throat> really name surprises that that are negative problems that I've heard about. And I'm not trying to puff this at all. I just I 
it's been uh, more positive than I anticipated. Reporting on cameras and microphones in the Illinois trial courts. For WQNA Radio, I'm Jim Grimes.